a little different format for us than usual, so bear with us if we have any technical issues. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers today. And uh, by the way, my name is Steve Samuelson, I should have told you that. And Bruce Bender is uh, running, running the program here. He's doing all the tech support today and running the meeting. Uh, our first speaker is Joe Cecil from the Office of the Flood Insurance Advocate. He's the Advocate Team Lead. And because we got a lot to cover, I'm just going to go straight into Joe. Oops. Thank, thank you, Steve. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks for inviting us. Um, I want to, first of all, just apologize on behalf of my boss, Dave Sterrett, the advocate, the head advocate. He's a little under the weather today, so asked me this morning to cover for him. Um, and uh, with, without further ado, I'll just go right into it. Uh, Bruce, if you could move to the next slide. Um, the Office of the Flood Insurance Advocate was created by the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014. It was created to advocate for the fair treatment of policyholders. And when the act was uh, first, first uh, signed into law, we spent a good deal of time thinking about what does that mean, the fair treatment of policyholders. And uh, we decided it, it has to mean more than just treating everyone the same, you know, particularly if that means treating everyone badly. <laughs> Um, there, there is a certain amount of, of truth to the idea that we're going to treat everyone the same under the law, but we, uh, we, we decided that uh, very kindly that our mission is to serve the frustrated and confused policyholders and property owners impacted by the National Flood Insurance Program and to help make the program less complex for them. So how do we do that? There, there's basically three things that we do. We provide direct assistance to policyholders and property owners that come to us through, um, they go to our landing page. Um, the, you can do an internet search, type in the words flood insurance advocate, we'll pop up at the top and you can see our landing page and there's a, at, at the bottom of the screen, there's a big button uh, says ask the advocate. <laughs> you, know, you can click on that and it'll send an email to us. Um, once we get the email, we'll assign a, uh, a caseworker to it and they, they'll, they'll reach out to you with the answer to your question and help you navigate the National Flood Insurance Program. Going beyond the direct assistance, we try to uh, collate the data from people that have come to us. We have a, a customer relationship management tool that we use to, to try to uh, I look at it and do some trend analysis to, to see what, what can we do that or uh, what's happening here that may be systemic. And then from that, we make recommendations to the program areas. Um, we are an independent office within the Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration. Brian is a member of the providers we have in Delaware, and I think you'll find that interesting. Opt-ins? Uh, please mute, mute your lines if you can. Um, Bruce, if you'd move to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, so what kind of cases come to us? What, and by case, I mean, what kind of inquiries uh, do people bring to our office when they land, when they hit our landing page and ask the advocate a question? Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see a pie chart of the case topics in, in, in very high-level categories. When they come to us representing just one policy or one property or one individual, usually the individual asking the question is asking about something that, that impacts them directly. It's, it's my house, my insurance policy. Um, and you can see in, on that left-hand side that 82% of the questions that come to us are directly related to flood insurance policies. Uh, about probably of that blue section, about 75% more or less is re related to the rating of a policy. Why is my premium so high? The remainder is usually uh, something claim related. Um, but we do get a mix of other issues from the other legs of the NFIP stool. If you're all familiar with the, the concept of the NFIP stool, uh, having four legs, um, insurance, identifying the risk through mapping, um, and then mitigating the risk through either ordinance or through grants. So we get some questions in the other legs of the stool. We do get some floodplain management questions. We get some mapping questions. Uh, hazard mitigation assistance. We also get some, some questions related to FEMA's Stafford Act activities, things that are going on with individual assistance, typically in, the, in this left-hand side. On the right-hand side of this slide, um, and this may be more pertinent to this audience, we do get a, uh, people who are representing a community, it might be a community official, it might be a, a, a state um, partner, we get people who are representing uh, homeowners associations, people impacted by a countywide map, um, people looking for assistance on a letter of map revision, th those types of things. And, and in the insurance side, we, we, it'll tend to be 
something that's impacting more than one policy or more than one person, such as uh, condominium association insured under the residential condominium building association policy. Um, so we thought it'd be interesting to show you what those look like. And there you see it's not quite as uh, heavily loaded with insurance. There are quite a few mapping questions that come to us, quite a few floodplain management questions. On the, the, the non-NFIP, there's still a little bit of individual assistance, but in, that, in, in that, that side of this slide, there might be some public assistance questions um, coming to us. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, we do produce every year an annual report. This is not something required in the legislation, but it is something that when we, when we set up the office, we went out and we looked at what do other advocacy groups uh, that, that have been created through, through legislation, the IRS tax advocate, we looked at other ombudsman's groups, and, and we saw that everyone pretty much produces an annual report. So we, we decided to mimic that. Um, in our annual report, uh, again, as an independent office, we do make recommendations to the program areas about things that we're seeing that might, might require a more systemic fix. Um, we identify those trends, and I'm just not going to read this slide to you, but we identify those trends basically in three ways. One is it could be volume driven. We're seeing the same thing over and over again, and it, you know, require, it re because we're seeing it so often, we want to call it out. Another is we may not be seeing an issue very often, but the, the level of frustration and the complexity of the problem is worth calling out because it's just something that, that it, you know, there just has to be an easier way to do this and we shouldn't be getting people so spun up on this particular kind of issue. And then the third thing, and this usually comes from our collaboration, even though we are an independent office, we do work collaboratively with the, with the programs, but sometimes we're seeing something, programs seeing something, and, and the program is saying to us, hey, why don't you go ahead and call this out in your annual report, get some attention on it so that, uh, so that we can make sure it's getting the focus it needs. Um, we typically identify five to seven topics. And so the next slide, Bruce, we're gonna show you what the topics were in our 2019 annual report. This is the most recent one. It was released um, in the first quarter this year. Um, when we release these, I wanna be clear, we're acting as the voice of the customer. We word things that sometimes sound a little uncomfortable to, um, to, 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 to the program areas or to, to our partners who are working the program areas. And, and, and the first one is an example of that. Improper application of elevation rating using an elevation certificate. One thing I wanna say clearly up front, particularly uh, with, with uh, folks on insurance, we're not saying federal insurance is not following their rules and regulations. They are. <laughs> um, what we're saying is policyholders don't understand those rules and regulations and, and feel that it's being applied improperly. Um, one, of the, um, one of the first, uh, in this first issue, what, what, we're, what we're trying to identify specifically is with an elevation certificate, I think most of you are aware, I know I've talked to you all back when Bigger Waters was first being implemented about the, the phase out of what we call pre-firm subsidized rates, discounted rates for older buildings that exist be before a community's initial flood insurance rate map. As those discounts are being phased out, the way we determine what is the right rate we should be charging you is to use an elevation certificate for the property. It gives us very property specific information about how much water is going to get into that home during the base flood event, not just the base flood event, but, but other, other flood events as well so that we can accurately price that building. Um, as these rates, as the discounted rates continue to rise, people are bringing us elevation certificates. Some of them are finding out right away that they're, that, oh, I, the, the increases can stop. I've reached my full risk rate. Some of them are finding out, oh, I'm still a ways away from it. But what we discovered was there were people who gave an elevation certificate for a pre-firm building to their insurer way back before Bigger Waters ever was enacted. And they didn't, you know, so they just assumed you're gonna take me off this glide slope automatically. In, in many cases, the insurance company filed that away in a drawer and never keyed it in their system. What we asked the program to do um, is, is to, to, to allow a refund going back in time to when that elevation certificate became favorable to them as the, as the discounts being phased out. Program agreed to that. And what that means um, is that some of those folks are getting refunds 
Um, typically, refunds are limited to five years. They're getting refunds that may go back six, seven, or eight years uh, because the increases have been in, 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 in flight for, for a good seven or eight years now under bigger waters. Um, the second one, loss of rating discounts, it's the same discounts we're talking about. It's the older buildings, pre-firm buildings, grandfathered buildings, and they lose the discount following a lapse in coverage. Now that's what the law says, and there's not much that can be done. If we don't have any authority to change the law. But what about uh, when a third party is the reason for the lapse? It was no, no, um, no action of the policyholder caused it. Well, the program looked at, at our recommendation and agreed that, um, that if somebody's been paying into escrow, they made their payment on time and, uh, and they shouldn't lose discounts if the, if, the, if the individual property owner is acting um, responsibly. Prior to us pointing this out, the program was just looking at, hey, did you pay late? <laughs> and it was pretty black and white, very binary. Now they're asking a little more information about, well, why did this lapse? Um, the third one, um, and this one confuses everyone, uh, so, so I'm going to try to explain it simply, but um, the, the best example, if I've got anyone on the line from Texas or Louisiana, where you've had some uh, flooding happening year after year with major disasters. Um, think of Texas with tax day flooding, uh, Memorial Day flooding, then Harvey, then Imelda. <laughs> And, and what's happening is we're getting declared disasters where people qualify for a group flood insurance policy. Um, I hope most of you know what that is, but it's a, it's a policy that uh, really to qualify for, you've got to be pretty low income because you didn't qualify for a small business administration loan, um, didn't qualify for some other assistance. What we do is we use part of our individual assistance grant money to buy a flood insurance policy for these folks. And then we buy it for an entire group of people. Well, sometimes the, the, the processing happens where you've been approved based on the first flood and the second flood happens before you got evidence of insurance. And that was creating a lot of confusion. So we've worked with the program to try to, um, to make, make that process more, more transparent and to try to make sure that the, that the group flood policy is getting out there as, you know, as quickly as possible to, to people so that they know whether they have coverage or not. Um, limited refunds after receiving a letter of MAP amendment. Our office a couple years back said that anybody who gets a letter of MAP amendment really ought to be refunded back to the date of the, that the firm, the flood insurance rate map became effective that's being amended. Uh, the, the program areas did not agree with us on that. They said, you know, the, the maps aren't wrong when you give us parcel specific information uh, that, that helps us determine that you're on a natural land island or, or, you know, on the very edge of the line and happen to be a, a tenth of a foot above the base flood elevation. The, 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 they rejected that, that recommendation that we, that we treat that, those entirely as misratings. So we came back last year and said, okay, we agree with you where the property is inside the floodplain that, and you get a Loma to get out, that, that that shouldn't be called a misrating. But what about where the property was clearly out as shown, where, where the in, uh, lender or insurance company just put the dot on the wrong pro rooftop? <laughs> um, program agreed, yeah, that should be treated as a misrating. Uh, so um, that, that now is eligible for five years of, of refund due to, due to a misrating. The last one, this is one of those ones where we worked with the program. You, you, if you went back and looked at all of our annual reports, you'll see ICC, increased cost of compliance. Um, claims come up quite frequently. It is a complex process. We're aware of that. Um, and, and this is one where working with the program, they said, why don't we put something in the annual report to signal to folks that if the requirements to, um, to, to uh, rebuild higher, but stronger, more resilient are in the building permit and the substantial damage letter happens to be dated after that um, because of backlogs due to or whatever's happening after a disaster, um, then the two things should be seen as jo to uh, join together and, and we should go ahead and pay that claim. Because what was happening before we called this out is the insurance companies were just automatically denying the claim, saying that's a voluntary elevation project, it's a voluntary uh, demo demolition or whatever activity was going on. 
and and they were just denying the the claim because it was not uh, not done to bring you into compliance. It was considered voluntary. Um, so this is this is a way to free up some I, ICC funds. If you're working any of those, maybe with the hazard mitigation assistance program, keep that in mind and, and make sure those get escalated to the program so they can issue any waivers they need to or give any direction that, that needs to be given to to, uh, to an insurance company, one of our right now partners. Um, Bruce, if you could move to the next slide. <clears throat> This year's annual report will be a little different. I don't want to dwell too long on this slide. Uh, you'll, you'll see it uh, once we get it through the, uh, the, the process. We haven't uh, delivered it yet to Mr. Marstadt or to Mr. Gaynor. Um, but, but once we've done that, we, we will do a public rollout. We're doing a five-year re retrospective this year. So it'll be more of a look back, um, less focus on, on specific issues that we're seeing this year. We will give uh, a little bit of a progress report on what we, you know, where the program ha has gone with many of our recommendations. The good news is every single recommendation has been acted on in, in one way or another. And about a third of them have been completely, you know, they, they were completely embraced and, and completely acted on. Um, some of them they intend to bring to full completion. There's a few where the program came back and said, we hear what you're saying, we want to do it a slightly different way. But it, it, you know, the, the, it's still good. They're they're still acting on those things. So, um, it's it tells you that the the office has been quite successful in identifying areas of improvement that that can actually be acted on and make the customer experience better. Um, we will talk a little bit about emerging trends. And with that said, I want to go right into the next slide, which is the 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 trends we we've, we've seen emerging in our 2019 annual report. And Joe, if we can uh, finish up soon. Yeah, this great. is the last slide. Way um, to go. <laughs> the, the, um, moving forward, uh, we do support efforts to move to risk rating. The federal insurance is doing um, the, the, the philosophy behind it to make rates more fair, easier to understand, and more transparent. Totally embrace that. We, we, we agree 100%. In fact, um, I've done a detail with uh, with federal insurance to help out a little bit with that. Um, our staff is, is ready and available um, and we're preparing for that. We also recognize that that'll lead right into the second item we identify is you, if you've been involved in this program, you know that uh, obtaining an elevation certificate to get a quote for flood insurance is painful for a lot of people. It's a large out-of-pocket expense. Risk rating 2.0 will alleviate that for many policyholders and we, we fully support that in any any efforts that can uh, reduce that burden. Um, the third one is one that got a lot of uh, buzz in the press. We were happy to see that. It's not one that, uh, that the program areas have much control over, but uh, there's, because of privacy law restrictions, we cannot reveal much about loss history to the public or to a potential buyer. Um, but we, we are encouraging um, the public to, to, to consider ways to uh, perhaps amend local law to, to increase flood disclosure, whether it's the zone, whether it's loss history, and those types of things. Um, again, we did see a lot, of, uh, a lot of buzz in this in the press, which is exactly what we were hoping to do was to start a conversation about this topic. Um, and then a kind of a passion project of ours, one that we're, we're very, um, very engaged in is trying to find ways to to get our office in front of um, out, out doing outreach to communities that have frankly been underserved by FEMA, by the National Flood Insurance Program, who, who maybe Butch's team can't reach, you know, the, 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 in, in their marketing efforts. Um, we do a lot of our marketing through internet and things like that. So how do we reach people who don't have internet access? Uh, what, what can be done to make the program better for seniors? What, what can we do in English as a second language or, or for low income? Is there something we can do as we think about product redesign that might, that might be remove some of the barriers to purchasing flood insurance? And that ties right into the fifth bullet is affordability is, is always going to be an issue. We're always going to be looking at, you know, how can we make, um, make our products and services more affordable to, uh, particularly to low income uh, people that live in the special flood hazard area. And with that, I am finished presenting, is, uh, is, it, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. 
Yeah, I don't know if we have time for that, but our, can you hang in to the end and we hope to- uh, Absolutely, uh, I'll be uh, online. Answer them then? Yep. Great, thanks. Um, I'm gonna try some, uh, Butch, if you're on, can you um, unmute yourself? I am here. Okay, I hit Let's stop share. If I can get my, there's my camera. Okay, here I am. All right, Hi, everybody. If the, lower, if the lower bottom is share your screen, see that green button? Yep, I'm good to go on that if you don't mind. All right, did, did it pop up? I will up? drive, and give me 30 seconds. Okay. Oh, and then I'll hit share. How's that look? Awesome. Can you see that? Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, my name is Butch Kinerny. I am the Chief of Marketing and Outreach for the National Flood Insurance Program. Those of you who have been in the program for a while will recognize my very old sign that I stole from the office be before we got kicked out and sent home. So um, Bruce asked me to talk uh, quickly about the National Flood Insurance Program's marketing and outreach initiatives. Um, I will say that I've grown a little bit of a beard here, but I have not grown nearly as much as Joe Cecil has. So I'm, I'm impressed by his uh, COVID hair there. Uh, tell you a little bit about, let me see if I can get this guy working. Oh, there we go. All right, so what's been on my mind in FY20? Uh, so I talk about the three R's. Uh, it, it actually is, is four R's, but there's reauthorization, and it looks like uh, Congress has just given us uh, uh, close to a one-year reauthorization of the program. I heard that this morning. So reauthorization, reform, and risk rating are always on my mind in FY20. As far as outreach and marketing kinds of things that we should be doing, I'll talk about a little bit about this more in a second. We're gonna transition away from the C3 contract. Those of you guys who have been familiar or worked with uh, any of our C3 contractors over the last four years, that contract came to its natural end, partly because we spent money faster than we thought we would. And we are moving towards a new contract and the new contract hopefully will be announced by the end of the fiscal year, which is I think next Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. So you're gonna see some, uh, you'll see some new faces and some new names. We don't have anything quite as, uh, as fun as C3. We talked about C4, uh, but we decided that name was a little too explosive. So we're still looking for a new name for our new marketing contract, but Digital customer, customer engagement is one of the things that I spend an awful lot of my time working on. That involves the new websites. That also involves uh, a new social media presence for the NFIP. And that involves a new customer relationship management system, which would not only look at our, our 5 million policyholders, but also all of you. Uh, all of the stakeholders, all the people that have some equity in the National Flood Insurance Program, and how do we sort of digitize some of that and make that a little smarter uh, than just copying and pasting emails from Excel spreadsheets, which is sort of what we do now. Um, but how do, we, how do we do that more smartly? Uh, and then 2020, am I right? COVID has been on my mind in 2020. Hurricane season, more active than uh, probably ever. Uh, we're already in, uh, what is it, Tropical Storm Beta in the Greek alphabet. So that is certainly on my mind this year with a, a, an extremely active hurricane season. Thankfully, from a claim standpoint, it hasn't been, uh, hasn't been a catastrophic year yet, but we still have two months to go, so fingers crossed. Uh, also an extraordinary fire season. I pay an awful lot of attention uh, attention to, uh, to an extraordinary fire season uh, that I worry about. Uh, I'm also worried, of course, about murder hornets and Kanye West running for president. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, how this looks graphically. Uh, if you look over here on the left-hand side of the screen, there's reauthorization, risk rating, and NFIP reform. That little space in the Venn diagram is what I control in all three of those areas. I have to be aware and concerned of, about all of them, but uh, my, uh, my sphere of influence on all three of those is that little tiny dot there right in the middle, which obviously is not much. 
Um, but I do uh, absolutely need to be uh, prepared for when those kinds of things happen, um, especially uh, NFIP reform and risk rating. Reauthorization, uh, it looks like it'll be another uh, continuing resolution. It doesn't look like Congress planning lots of changes, uh, at least for the short term. Um, but uh, there is always congressional interest in the program. And so we are always answering questions of members of Congress. So uh, if you look at my other Venn diagram over on the right-hand side, so we've got the new communications contract, we've got digital customer engagement, uh, we've got uh, the 2020 hurricane season, fire season, COVID season, all of those kinds of things have required uh, flexibility on our end and, uh, and uh, ship steering in the middle of the year. Uh, sometimes we, uh, we like to you know, plan things far in advance and then we have to kind of shift on a dime. So all three of those have been major shifts in our year. I'll talk about COVID in, in, in a couple of minutes, specifically what we did on that front. Uh, but really, instead of a little tiny arrow, I've got a big umbrella that is over all of those things. That little umbrella is kind of my group in, in uh, federal insurance and what we do. Things I can't control, things completely out of the sphere, uh, of course, are murder hornets and whether or not Kanye is going to run. So let's talk a little bit about flood insurance. Uh, in hurricane season, uh, we kicked off our hurricane season campaign on June 15th. Uh, we just wrapped it up. We reached uh, 27 million some adults. Uh, we've tried some new things. That is, uh, that is a billboard, uh, an electronic billboard actually in Houston, uh, which pops up when it's raining. Uh, these are new uh, ads that we have um, rolled out in the last year or so, it's called Chase the Rain. Um, this is actually what, what's called an out of home extension. Uh, we also have these uh, uh, things built into your Weather Channel app. So if it's raining and you're one of a, in one of our target markets, uh, we're popping a little ad to you to talk about flood insurance while it's raining, uh, while you're looking at the weather. And we do this a variety of ways. We do it on, uh, we do it on billboards. We do it on Nextdoor. Uh, we do it on um, uh, if you go searching for a story about flood or something and you're in one of our target markets and or it's raining, then you'll get a flood insurance ad. We've got some new uh, post-disaster videos. Uh, these are our hurricane markets. Um, you can see it, uh, it's fairly typical. Um, there were a couple of areas that we bypassed this year because we had done heavy advertising in them last year. And uh, we uh, uh, periodically have to shift things around just a little bit. But at least at the beginning of the year, this is where we were working. Um, we've got uh, a variety of paid media tactics. Uh, we've got some new videos uh, on the agents.floodsmart.gov website. Um, we've got some new tools there. And certainly if you guys need any of that kind of information, please reach out to me. We've got all of that stuff, all the social media assets, all available for you all on the agent site. Uh, this year we had a new Hawaii initiative for Hawaii hurricane season. We actually put some of these ads in native Hawaiian. We also had some ads done in native Hmong uh, in Minnesota. Uh, and we teamed up with the uh, Minnesota public broadcasting uh, crowd to help us translate some of our advertising. Um, and they did this for nothing. We also have a fairly new aggressive campaign to talk about flood loss avoidance. We've got some new videos prior to landfall. And then after landfall, we've got a whole variety of stuff on how to file your claim. Uh, we've got a ton of new online resources. If you've not been to floodsmart.gov or agents.floodsmart.gov recently, you haven't been uh, because we have moved an awful lot of information off FEMA.gov. We've moved all of the data off FEMA.gov. It's, it, it's now resting in a place called nfipservices.floodsmart.gov. Um, but FEMA got, uh, got a makeover, an extreme home makeover, and uh, they were trying to streamline what they had. We wanted a one-stop shop so you didn't have to go on FEMA.gov and get frustrated by trying to search for something that you never find. And so we put all that on their, our data page. Uh, after a flood, talking points are modified this year. Um, number one, uh, we wanted to uh, use a more empathetic tone. And so everything you're going to hear on our after the flood talking point is that we know rebuilding after a flood can be very difficult. 
and uh, we stand ready to make it as easy as possible. One of the things that we also wanted to talk about is it may take a little bit more time this year uh, to rebuild, and we ask for your patience uh, through, through the recovery process. Uh, we are also doing our post-flood agent outreach. We always do it after storms, although we've gotten a lot better at it. It used to be we'd go out to an agent's office with a, just a, a, a gigantic textbook full of stuff uh, that was completely useless to agents. And it was, I always called it the hostess gift. And uh, it was completely meaningless. It's like that cheap bottle of wine that you put on the shelf and you never actually look at when somebody shows up at your house. Same kind of thing. So we have streamlined that process. We've streamlined the uh, agent marketing materials. So make a lot easier for the agents to kind of understand uh, what's going on with flood insurance program, especially if they're not active. Uh, we also, I mentioned flood after fire. Uh, we've got a whole new flood after fire campaign. These are some social media assets you see floating around. There's also uh, some new videos for flood after fire. That is a, a, obviously a gigantic risk and, and place for concern for us in, in FY20. And we are uh, continuing to work with that. Uh, we're actually working with regions eight, nine, and 10. Uh, so it's, it, sometimes it just seems like it's a region eight thing or a region nine thing. Uh, but no, this is actually a region eight, nine, and 10 thing this year. And so we're working with those guys uh, on almost di a daily basis to uh, try to get the word out about the increased risk this year. Uh, we also did regional activations. So we did regional advertising campaigns in all FEMA regions. We looked specifically at flood anniversaries. I did, uh, I did some significant work actually out in Omaha, Nebraska uh, this year because they had massive flooding there last year. Came back a year later, stood around a home show, got an awful lot of interest uh, there, had a lot of interest from local media, talked with the Realtor Association, the insurance agent of uh, uh, association and uh, and had really good success uh, doing some of those flood anniversary things. We're also looking at map changes and we're looking at other kinds of flood contexty things. Uh, so what's going on in FY21? New contract in place, new comms contract. We're going to continue our focus on digital engagement. So expect to hear and see more of that, including our new social media presence that we're going to uh, roll out starting on LinkedIn in FY21, reason we're doing LinkedIn is because we recognize that our stakeholder community is probably one of the places that we really need to have a more direct connect uh, with you guys. So, so look for us on LinkedIn. Obviously, risk rating 2.0 and the rollout of that. We're going to be working very closely with uh, with Tony's team. We already have been working very closely with Tony's team uh, on on risk rating 2.0. Obviously, there's re reform and reauthorization, and as I think Nikki may be talking about this, I'm not positive, but uh, reform and reauthorization is kind of a, a constant thing. We want to continue to build on the successes that we've had in some of our regional activations. Uh, those have been really exciting, and the regions really appreciate it. We're able to do some micro-targeting in areas we might not ordinarily get to do, and that's it. Great. Um, I don't see any immediate questions. Um, okay, I'll, I'll so, stand by, Bruce. Okay, so if you could, uh, like you say, stand by. I do want to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, that the um, the agentsfloodsmart.gov had, even though it says agents in front of it, and you can correct me on this, uh, Butch, if you want, or but has materials that could easily be used by local officials and floodplain managers, a lot of you on the phone. Uh, instead of saying the word client or customer, you might say the word, uh, you know, property owner or resident business owner, but the messaging is all there. It'd be con then consistent with what uh, uh, Butch's group is doing. So definitely, as Butch said, take time to look out there and let me zoom through to the next ones. Yeah, the one thing I'll throw in there too, uh, and I, I had it in the presentation, I pulled it out. Um, we have a fantastic uh, kind of an NFIP 101. It's called for state insurance commissioners and others. But if you've got people that need to understand the NFIP from a very base level um, standpoint, uh, go on FEMA.gov or it's probably on, on the agent site as well. Go take a look at that. Um, that um, it's called a, a desktop reference uh, for insurance commissioners and, and others involved in the National Flood Insurance Program. 
fantastic resource. It really tells you what to do before, during, and after a flood. But if you've got elected leadership, uh, new appointed leadership, if you've got new people and you need to, to kind of hand them something uh, on the NFIP uh, that's that's written from a, a stakeholder perspective, but a very basic perspective, uh, make sure you take a look at that. And, that is a great document. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, thanks. If if during this you happen to find the link to it and put it in the chat, that'd be great. Oh, I, I can do that. Yeah, I'll do and that. And I in noticed. This moment. Okay, and I noticed a couple questions. If you could answer them in the chat, I'm going to move along since we have a lot to cover and uh, have Susan Crowell come in. And she's lead insurance examiner examiner for the uh, uh, NFIP underwriting branch. Uh, I know it's a tough act, Susan, to follow Butch, anybody to follow Butch, uh, but yeah. uh, go ahead. And uh, Yeah, hey, I'm doing what the guys are doing. I'm letting my hair grow out. Talk. Beard thing going, the hair thing going. Anyway, um, so thank you, everybody, uh, for coming, and uh, thank you for listening to me. I, it's probably not going very exciting. You've probably heard this before, but uh, I... I you know, Bruce asked for underwriting to be here and just uh, go over the 2020 flood insurance manual changes. Um, so here are some of the highlights. Um, these were uh, announced last year in October 2019. Um, we went and uh, some of the highlights we did is we uh, streamlined the verification requirements for primary residence status. If the property address and mailing address don't match, you know, why bother them with obtaining information? It's obvious, you know, it, it, it's, a, it, it's an inconvenience for the customer to have to prove that that is their primary residence when everything on the declaration says, or the application says primary residence, property address matches, mailing address matches. So, you know, take their word for it. Don't inquire, don't interrogate them per se is what I called it. Um, then we've updated the methodology FEMA uses to determine the non-residential flood proofing premium discount. And we updated the list of required documentation. We were getting a lot of questions of what, what do you need? Why is this needed? Why does it say this in the flood insurance manual? So we've updated that. So, uh, you know, people would have it right, very transparent to know what they needed immediately. Um, to uh, ask for a flood proofing uh, premium discount. Um, we re remo removed the V-Zone risk rating factor form since we're um, discontinuing its use for policies that was effective on April 1st, 2020. Um, the community rating system and eligible communities were updated. Um, that effective has May 1st, 2020. That list was effective even though it was put into the April FIM. Um, we clarified that if the community CRS class changes or given policies eligibility for a CRS discount changed midway through a policy term, that any resulting adjustment to the CRS discount would apply only at the next policy renewal. Um, we updated the premium rates for policies written or renewed on or after April 1st, 2020. And the severe repetitive loss reserve fund assessment percentage for policies did increase um, for uh, policies written on or after April 1st, 2020. There was an Ackerman list uh, in, uh, added to the manual. Um, can you change the slide please, Bruce? Okay, so for, for the premium rates, um, the overall premiums increased from an average of $873 per policy to $972, um, which was an 11.3% increase. Uh, the SRL premium additional fee, in, fee increased, it went up to 10%. And the reserve fund assessment fee went from 15 to 18. Uh, there was no change to the ICC premium, the deductible factor, federal policy fee, HFIA surcharge, and probation surcharge. Thank you. So January 1st, 2021 changes were also announced in October of 2019. 
Um, we, uh, the uh, preferred risk policies and newly map rated policies uh, on or after January 1st, 2021, uh, the premium multiplier was um, changed under the newly mapped procedure. So all those multipliers went up. Um, the preferred risk policy premium um, that went uh, from increased to 14.9%, which was a total amount build increased of 12.5%. And the A99 AR zone policies that were eligible for the PRP or are eligible for the PRP, the premiums increased 14.9% with the total amount build increased of 12.2%. And then the properties newly mapped in the SFA, into the SFH um, has a result of increases to the multiplier that were that were, they were all effective on January 1st, 2021. The premiums for newly mapped policies, they increased 14.8% um, with a total amount build increase of 12.5%. So all those three classifications pretty much increased uh, the same amount with the total amount build fairly the same. Um, for October 2020, the CRS information, we used to list the CRS, CRS community information in what is known as Appendix F. Um, it was decided that there would be a link to that information, and that is the link. I will say for the next round, originally we were not putting in the CRS community information any more to the Appendix F, but I know for April 2021, they will still list it and there will still be a link. But from there on out, it should only have this link in the manual to obtain CRS community information. Um, one other item, yeah. is elevation certificate, which- Yay. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, I mean, I guess I'm going to have to put on my boots and lipstick and make a personal appearance. Yeah. Um, I, I have multiple emails. I was told once the EC was processed, renewed with no changes, then they would be able to make those five changes that the Flood Insurance Committee EC group did along with other stakeholders. And I've been waiting. I, I mean, I was, I think it's what, two years now? It's going on two years? Yep. Now, at this, the rate we're going, the EC is gonna be up for renewal. So I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get an answer. Um, the gentleman that I dealt with has moved on. So I am working with a um, new person um, it's supposedly in OMB and I'm trying to get an answer if this is going to happen this year, are they just going to try to fold it into the next renewal? And as soon as I can get an answer, I will definitely net, uh, let Bruce know about it. And but is, uh, is there anything ASFPN can do? I know sometimes the, the group at this point, I'm not sure, but if you, um, if you can, if I, if you, if it would help, I will definitely get back to you. I need to have a discussion. Okay, let us know. Um, like you said, it's a few people. Years. Yeah. Um, I, I, one of the things that jumped out at me, and I noticed actually, there's a comment here from Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer. Um, the the PRP really jumped up this year, um, fifteen yeah. percent, uh, which is the most I think it has in a long time, or perhaps ever. Is there some, is that because of all the uh, losses that have been occurring in like Houston and Baton Rouge and other areas because Mother Nature is not sticking to the 1% storm? Um, yes, from, I believe so. Um, I can't say exact for sure, but I, I believe so. I believe the actuary's analysis um, done, uh, they realized we were uh, capturing mm -hmm. enough premium. Okay for that category of risk, so right. they adjusted that um, classification, the PRPs, right. based on the loss history, past losses, past years. Right. There is a question, if you could, uh, as we move on, could Mike 
uh, answer, Jennifer. I don't know if you can or not, or be able okay. to, to, to do that. But um, thank you very sure. much, as always, for the, the update. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Um, next, we have uh, Tony. I believe you got on. If you can unmute yourself. Uh, Tony is overseeing the risk rating uh, 2.0 as part of the, the transformation. Um, I also asked him just to give a quick highlight on or update on the policy part of the transformation, uh, but he's going to just give us a verbal update on risk rating 2.0. Tony? Uh, good afternoon, folks, and thanks for having me. I, I didn't want to use the presentation that you've probably seen bits and pieces of over the past two years, so I just want to give you guys uh, Susan did something great for me. She led this, uh, uh, let me write in uh, a natural transition when she was talking about the rate increases for 2021. Um, and she also talked about the for uh, 2020. So in 2020, we had 11.3% uh, average rate increase for single family homes. And then she just gave you updates on the rate increases uh, for many of the different classifications, uh, many of which go up 15%. And the reason I'm taking that opportunity, 2.0 would take them up if they get went up to a maximum of 18%. So, you know, all the hoopla out there about risk rating increasing um, premium substantially is not really justified if, if you look at, at what we're doing. And that can lead me into, you know, what risk rating 2.0 is not doing. And it is not uh, supplanting any statutory requirement. We need to keep nailing that home. There's, uh, you know, limits on the increases in statute. Um, there's mandatory purchase. Um, you know, all the floodplain mapping, uh, the floodplain management, all those things. Nothing changes on that front through risk rating 2.0. What changes in risk rating 2.0 are the rates and the risk that we analyze. So essentially what we're going to do is uh, go from a zone-based rate and clustering it to an individual property rate. Uh, so Bruce could get understand the risk for his property and he could understand that rate. Um, I think one thing that I do want to reference is some folks will go up and some folks will go down um, and under risk rating 2.0. I will let some cats out of the bag today that we're very close to finishing the uh, risk rating and the premium calculation worksheet for the entire book of business. We're also very close to finishing the uh, business decisions that need to be made um, on the uh, risk rating 2.0 front. Uh, we have also set up what we call an industry um, subcommittee. On that industry subcommittee that we engage on risk rating 2.0, there are probably seven of the biggest write your owns, every one of the vendors, uh, agents, FIPNIC and IBHS, they act as a sounding board for us, so we are not doing this alone. Um, and they help us along that way. Uh, we're making tons of progress on the guidance, on the application, the deck page, and all those things. Uh, we had started high-level training. Some actually occurred yesterday. Um, that really covers the, the 101 of what we're doing with Risk Rating 2.0, and detailed training will start around the beginning of the year. Um, we have a communications plan in place. Uh, that communications plan uh, can't really move forward at the moment. Um, uh, we have the election in front of us and some of those things, so we need to be very careful on how we strategically step through communicating this. Um, we do have challenges. I'm not going to fool you. There are challenges with the Paperwork Reduction Act associated with risk rating 2.0, and you know we have to do a new uh, application there are new questions that we haven't asked before, of which we need data. Um, if we have to uh, ask those questions, we can't without the PRA. So therefore we have to have the PRA to get a lot of those paperwork and documents and applications and things through. So that is one of our challenges. Uh, we also have to deal with data integrity. Uh, there's a lot of data coming in. Um, as you guys were made aware before, we have data coming in from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, from USGS, we have slosh modeling, we have coastal modeling, we have tsunami modeling. We also have cat models coming in. Uh, we have the policy data, uh, we have claims data. There's a lot of things coming in. Uh, we do have set standards of what's acceptable uh, within the premium calculation worksheet to impact the rate. And there are gaps in that, and we need to figure out how we fill those gaps. Uh, do we make assumptions? Uh, do we do other 
uh, uh, analysis or do we try to get that information from the private sector? So that's another challenge we have. And then finally, another long pole in the tent is the system development, testing, and then implementing and integrating. So there are challenges on there that, you know, aren't insurmountable, but they'll be tough. Um, so we are still on target though, to deliver a new pricing paradigm uh, on October 1st, 2021. Uh, we moved that last November. I think many of you were made aware through some of our other presentations or through our ASFPM presentation of uh, this past year. Uh, we were originally going to let out part of the book for the Southeast, and then we decided we would do it all at once for the entire book, levied, non-levied, single family home, commercial, RC BAP, you, know, you name it, all would come out at one time. And we put that date at October 1st, 2021. Um, your guys are pretty smart. You know what's going on. In order to do that, we would have to do renewals prior to that date. Uh, probably starting sometime in the summer, July of 2021. And we would have to engage the Write Your Owns and they would have to have information data and things in their systems probably by April 1st of 2021. So we are progressing. I gave you four of the key dates that we have. Um, we've expanded this, like I said, to the entire book. Um, I've given you pretty much what's not changing. Uh, CRS isn't changing as well. Um, you know, the transfer of uh, policies and discounts isn't changing. Uh, what is changing is we won't require an elevation certificate. And I'm gonna say that because I saw a question on that earlier and responded. An elevation certificate is not required. However, it can be submitted uh, to be used uh, to uh, assist in building your rate. It's not required though. It is still required for all other aspects of the NFIP. Um, we are also going to uh, increase the mitigation uh, activities. And what I mean by that is you previously would only be able to get credit for elevating on post piles and piers within a special flood hazard area. We'll extend that to the entire book of business, regardless of zone. So there are a lot of things, like I said, involved with this. There's things that definitely aren't changing. Um, anything statutory, regulatory, none of that stuff changes. CRS stays the same, flood management mapping, um, all of the statutory uh, limits and requirements stay in place. So with that, I think I'll stop with risk rating 2.0 and just give you something quick on uh, the uh, policy forms. I think many people know that this is in, uh, in the process. We can't say a whole lot about the policy forms. The homeowner policy form is, uh, in its approval process. And we continue to work on the landlord form, the tenant form, uh, the mobile home and manufactured home form, the condo unit form, the RC BAT form, and commercial owner and tenant form. So we have those all and work in progress and moving forward with those. So Bruce, I spoke there about 10 minutes. I just wanted to make sure I left the opportunity for folks to ask questions. Um, I think a lot of people are well aware of what um, I've been saying. I gave a quick update on where we are, but if there are questions, I would like to take them if we could. Sure, and one of the ones that uh, I wanna bring up that people keep talking about a PRP, and I, and I remember long ago, um, uh, the, the, the comment was made by, I think Andy or something, well, will there be a PR, will there be a PRP? Because uh, as uh, once you go into a non-special flood hazard area, no matter where you are, the 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 PRP premiums the same, top of the mountain or the bottom of the mountain, if they're both zone X. Can you comment on what it might look like uh, on risk rating 2.0? Since we have a couple of questions around PRP. Of yeah, of course there won't be a PRP. So there won't be a PRP under risk rating 2.0 because each individual property has a unique risk and will have a unique premium. So you saw the uh, increase in 2020 for PRP. What's coming up for 2021, I'm sorry, I forget which year I'm going to fiscal year. Um, so we know it's a problem in the PRPs and we're not collecting enough money. Many people in the PRP are not paying their full risk. Um, they're actually getting a great deal there, um, but I'm not saying all of them are. I'm saying there's a lot of other people that will probably have their premium go down in the PRP. But those sitting right next to the X zone on some of the barrier islands have gotten one heck of a good deal for the past 20, 30 years. Um, and that's, that's about to end. People need to pay their, their risk. They need to pay the risk 
and the premium associated with that risk. So the PRP will go away. Under risk rating 2.0, there will be a minimum premium and a maximum premium. So I know under some of the previous legislation, BW12, there were premiums of $68,000 in some places. That will not occur under risk rating 2.0. The max cap will somewhere be around 12 grand in under risk rating 2.0, which is substantially lower than BW12 and some of those other places. So, and the minimum will probably be below the current uh, PRP. But, but to your point earlier that the, as you roll out this, they still can't go the increases more than the statutory of 15, 18%. But Correct. if somebody's getting a lesser one, they could go straight to that new premium? You are correct. So any decreases in premium go in full in the first year. Great. So now, you could be paying $5,000 and we would say your premium should be 1500. You go to that as soon as risk rating is released. Okay. Everyone else is on the glide paths that are established. So now, some of these people, to get to that $12,000 premium, it's going to be 20 years, 25 years or more. Right. Um, so, so who knows there? So. And hopefully, as we saw with BW12, well, it generated, BW12 generated a lot of great discussion around mitigation. So maybe that might just help drive in those, those areas. Yeah, and I, I think if you tie this, there's perfect timing along with this new BRIC program, the new grant program coming out. Uh, there will be a slew of money uh, <laughs> uh, available uh, through that program in the coming year just because of the amount of money that we put out through HMGP. So there was a ton of money that's gone out just under COVID through HMGP and through that process, or actually through the disaster fund, uh, which impact HMGP and would also impact the brick amount of funding. So there's something like $30 billion that already went out to states um, to assist with COVID. That's in addition to whatever's going out in disaster. So there'll be a lot of funding available under a brick for mitigation activities. Awesome. You mentioned uh, I've got, there are several others, so I'll pick some and then we'll we'll move on because uh, I want to make sure one Nikki is is on. She was going to try to get on around uh, to her time, so we're getting close to the top of the hour. But uh, you talked about the coastal barrier and, and, and coastal. Uh, in one of the presentations you've done, you highlighted actually how many V-Zone policies there are, or really, to me, it was the price, are not. Um, and somebody asked about what the impact might be on coastal. So I'm wondering if you happen to remember that statistic and then have any comment. Yeah, that statistic was for single family homes at the time. Right, because right. the analysis we had completed, there was, I'm going to guess, it's somewhere between 14 and 17,000 coastal properties. Um, Out of 5 million homes. That's it. Um, in addition to the whole grandfathering thing, there were only like 168,000 properties. So the big issues that people thought existed don't. Once we did the analysis through risk rating 2.0, we had a better uh, flavor and knowledge of what our book looked like. So the impact on some of those, you know, some of those are already paying the highest premiums. So it, it most likely won't impact them unless they're one of those that have been working the system in a sense um, to keep their premiums low, but their risk is actually high. Um, so grandfathering coastal properties aren't the big deal that they were. And I believe the reason they were so big in previous legislative um, challenges, um, to put it that way, were because we couldn't tell them the numbers. So we had no mechanism of saying how many grandfathered properties there were 10 years ago um, and the types. So now we have that detailed analysis. So I think I answered your question. No, that, that's good. Uh, I want to see if Nikki is on yet. Oops. If she can unmute, if she is. If not, we can take some more um, questions here. It says, uh, do the number of claims of an individual structure increase the rates for that individual, i.e. just like auto or homeowners insurance? Um, any any and review you To start out, that? We kind of swipe the slate, the slate clean, um, risk rating 2.0 on those claims, but because uh, losses do impact it. So claims data and policy data does impact it. It's one of the many factors that come into it. So, you know, I rattled off a bunch before, uh, but it's, you know, that along with the cat models and other industry information, along with the distance from the flooding source, the height above the ground, um, those basic things, the replacement cost value comes into it. So there's a whole lot of factors that come into the premium. It's much more 
Um, I want to say the premium calculation worksheet is more complex, but the process for the policyholder and what they need to do is much simpler. So, and the complexity adds to the integrity of that data. So we can put all those factors in and do the average mean losses associated with all those different things and blend them and come up with a more accurate depiction of an individual property's risk. And then, you know, we play with the certain factors that, uh, you know, how far you are from the, the coast or the flooding source, how far you are above the ground, what's your replacement cost value, what's the total uh, value of your uh, policy. You can pick your um, deductibles, those types of things. They really come into the play for the individual and how they impact that in the engine. I think some folks have seen demonstrations of what the what we call the risk rating 2.0 engine will do. And it is about 10 or 12 questions. And those questions then come back with a binding quote. So. Yeah, so there won't be as much underwriting and gathering of data that the agents can have to do. So they're gonna be able to uh, quote much more quickly. Yeah, that's correct. You know, it'll, the system will already know if it's an SRL property, the system will already know it's policy claims data, the system will know all those things that are already in it. And that comes out for uh, the agent. So it'll already have a replacement cost value in it. It'll already have a lot of those things located within it. Um, initially, we're going to have to go through the process of validating and cleaning some of that data up because no data is 100% accurate. So I anticipate in the first year, first version of this, we're going to have hiccups where we have to clean up data. So, okay. and then we'll use a manual process or some other process to clean it. So, okay. I know someone asked the logic behind the elevation certificate. Uh, the logic behind the elevation certificate is the elevation certificate itself is too complicated. Um, and then when you start trying to plug that into the rate, lags and hags and first floors and basements and crawl spaces and split levels and oh, attached garages and all those types of things make it so complicated. So we've taken that out and the biggest factors are your finished floor, um, how high, you know, basically how high you are above the ground, the ground elevation around you, the distance from the actual flooding source, um, you know, we also include some other things that we've never done before. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, localized drainage and fluvial and pluvial flooding, all those types of things come into play. And we also eliminate that false sense of security um, that you don't need insurance because you're at or above the BFE by a tenth of a foot. Uh, when the accuracy of all the data is not to a tenth of a foot. So, you know, that's where we try to, we try to eliminate some of those things. So. Uh, I'm going to stop as you probably, I don't know if you have the chat open, but it, you've got a lot of great questions. Oh, well, all questions are great. You have a lot of questions. Um, Steve, do you see uh, Nikki on, uh, or Nikki, if you have your mic, could you open it? Because I didn't see the name. Nikki Cruz is going to come in and talk to us about Pivot and Part, which uh, uh, a lot of you have an interest in. since that's I've been, access I've been going through the participant list checking for her name, Bruce. Okay. Do you yeah, Bruce, see chat? I think the schedule that you sent out, you had a break, and then I was going from 150 to two, I think, and then Nikki was going to pick. She was going to pick up at 210. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, she she was going to jump on it at 10. Um, why don't we do this uh, until she jumps on? Uh, do you mind taking some more questions for those who want to take a break? Take a break. No, that's um, fine with me. Um, so. For those who want to take a break, uh, as soon as Nikki gets back, I want to see Chad, are you on? Because if for some reason she has difficulty, we'll put you on. And uh, Nikki has a lot of slides, so I was kind of try to give her more time. Anyway, um, so the, the maximum coverage uh, is going to stay at 250,000. Uh, I don't think that's going to change because that's by law. But uh, talk to us about replacement cost. Uh, Denise has a question around replacement cost coverage, especially with homes that are a lot more these days than the 250, worth more than 250. Yeah, well, they'll actually have to put in their actual replacement cost value. And the reason being there, um, what we found is lower value homes were actually paying more for their insurance than higher value homes. So, you know, if I had a home that was actually worth, uh, you know, $150,000 and I got a foot of water in it, um, that was, you know, more damage in my home, but less money if I had a property that was a million dollars, I had 250 in coverage and I had a foot of water in it. 
So there was a disparity in there. So we bring in replacement cost value to help um, take that disparity away. Um, and we have a tool um, that calculates replacement cost value that we've uh, purchased from, through a third party. Um, that hits it uh, with replacement cost value. It looks at the different geographic discrepancies or differences and calculates them into replacement cost value as well. But replacement cost value helps balance out that disparity that I was talking about. So okay. That's why it's an important factor. A another area that I think this group is on, I've been told. Okay. Um, let me ask one or two other quick questions. And then maybe as Nikki's talking, if you can look through and if you're able to stay on till the end, because uh, I'm sure there's some of these will probably easier by word, uh, verbal than um, not. Um, if the CRS isn't changing, but there are more, uh, it says PFP policies, I'm gonna say maybe PRP policies. Uh, will all policies be eligible for CRS community discount? So how is CRS going to play into this? Because I think it's going through a transformation as well. Yeah, and I really can't answer that because they are going through a transition. They're planning on what they will be doing for the next two or three, four years. Um, but CRS won't change the way CRS is today, right now coming into risk rating 2.0. I can say that. For, for Rachel and what the future of that looks like. I know they're, they're planning that and they have a probably a very aggressive plan for 2021 through 2023, I believe, um, with CRS and how it could or couldn't change. I know they plan on uh, really ratcheting up the dialogue uh, with CRS communities and those involved with CRS um, during that process. So they'll probably take a very similar process to what we did with risk rating 2.0 with structured format, um, and engagement, those types of things. But I can't speak to the individual component. The, I guess the or, one, uh, CRS, sorry. The, the one that you might be able to, cause rereading this question, I think they're focused more on the PRP right now, as you know, there is no CRS discount on PRP. So mm -hmm. if you get rid of quote, the PRP as it's called, um, standard zone X rates or non PRP do get a five or 10% discount. Will that apply now that you get rid of PRP to the person at the top of the mountain as well as the bottom who are both? I would both say, I, yeah, I assume, yes, it does because I'm told nothing changes. Um, but I will have to dig back into that question. Um, I know that we've been doing some extensive dialogue between CRS and risk rating 2.0 and I'm not exactly sure uh, where we landed on some of those things, not this one specifically, but on some of those things, but I would rather they answer the question than I. <laughs> so a, another question and, and we'll, we'll finish up here. Uh, my gosh, you've got a whole lot. Uh, will a surveyor be needed to determine the height above ground or is this something the policyholder can do? Uh, so I thought that'd be a good question to talk to you about what the uh, engine is doing for you. Yeah, a surveyor would not be necessarily. Um, we will have a tool that can de develop uh, the first floor height and we'll put assumptions into place. But there's a lot of things in that tool. Uh, we look at the different construction types. Uh, we go by county and look at those types and we look at the type of architecture. All that stuff comes into play into the tool to help us generate a first floor height. I'm not going to say it's perfect. I'm going to say there's instances where it won't be and then we could ask, first of all, the, uh, excuse me, um, the write your own or the vendor, if they have other information that could be pulled off an elevation certificate or something else that could be provided for first floor height. Um, or we could use other mechanisms, some of which are gonna require the PRA process. Um, so if we would ask people the number of stairs up to their front door or something like that, we need to go through PRA. Uh, so there are different ways of calculating that. There's a lot of assumptions for different architectural types and building designs that we put into uh, the tool to help us generate the first floor height. It's not perfect. Nothing's perfect, but it's it's a good start to where we're going. And it, it allows for that quick, quick uh, quoting. Um, yeah. Another one real quickly that probably sent a tremor across one of clean slate. You've got community officials here on, on the line that have uh, severe repetitive loss properties. So are they going to get a clean slate to be rated normal or uh, and see a significant no. drop? Okay. No, um, we keep the CRS in play, but they, they the, won't. I'll just say no to that. You said the CRS, you mean the SRL? No. 
The SRL, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so so those stay there. And are you gonna be working with the mortgage companies uh, because th this, this is a gradational type rating and their mentality is black and white because that's the way the maps have been a long time, you know, in or out. Is there, a, do we need yeah, to there do are, any- They are part them? of our communication and engagement plan. We haven't yet, uh, it's, okay. it's you know, planned to happen. Uh, we need to complete some more of our analysis once we get everything done inside, I think we can explain it to them a little bit better, uh, you know, what we're doing and what the results and what the outcomes are, because I think they have to have a better understanding that just because a property is outside a special flood hazard area doesn't mean it has no risk. It could have extensive risk based on the factors. So we'll have to explain that to them. And like we said, they always hold the, um, you know, the ability to require Flood insurance, regardless of in or out. So that's that's the purview of the lender. So great. All right. Well, uh, thank you as always, Tony. Lots of questions. Everybody's very interested in uh, where this is going to do, how it's going to affect their business, how do they communicate this uh, to their constituents, um, along with you know elevation certificates and how that might help or not help uh, the premium, how they can explain that to them. So. Uh, if you wouldn't mind reviewing some of the questions in the chat, I'm going to move on. Um, okay. And Steve, uh, let's so, you uh, thank do you, the Bruce. introduction. It's, it's my pleasure to get to introduce Nikki Cruz. I asked Bruce if I could introduce her because she's been very helpful to the Flood Insurance Committee with some issues we had with Pivot in the past. And that's exactly what she's here to talk about today is, is Pivot. And so that we can keep on schedule, I'm just going to get right into it. Nikki, are you able to unmute yourself? Lower left-hand corner should be a mic. And All right. I think I got it. Can you guys hear right. me? We hear you. Woo All right. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. Bruce, Steve, thank you for inviting me um, to, to come talk about this topic. Um, uh, pivot in part, the near and dear to my heart, love, love uh, the insurance program and really love systems. So the combination uh, is, is, has been a pleasure to work on. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, it's a, a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, some, some big pivot updates, and I know some, some folks on the phone may not know what Pivot is. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, um, about what it is, the kind of reports it has, um, and, and kind of where we're, where we're going with it. Um, how to do some ad hoc data requests. I know that maybe not everything is in the system that we, that we need. Hopefully it is by now. Um, with our with our last release, but if it's not, we still have some ways to make sure that we get the data to folks the way they need it. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Privacy Act um, and about routine use letters and ISAs. We've made some big strides recently um, on that front around PII and being able to look at the way we do that a little bit differently with our Privacy Office and the Department of Homeland Security Privacy Office uh, working with us. So. Um, We'll talk a little bit about that and making sure that we can deliver PII in a safe and protected manner for our policyholders while enabling um, while enabling pr program um, program needs. Um, so if we go to the next one, we got some pivot updates. Next slide. Um, so we're, we're going to dive into what is pivot. Some some of the reports that are on part. Um, so it's a pivot analytics and reporting tool. So we've, uh, we've got a couple different types of types of, of reports there. And also we heard um, there were some issues with like the download and really being understand it, being able to understand how to do that. So we're gonna go over some tips and, tr and, and tricks uh, in that spot. So part is the pivot analytics and reporting tool um, for the uh, Monica down there. Um, and pivot is just the, is the system of records. We trans trans translated from the old TRRP system, and I can't remember what that stands for, I'm sorry, but it used to be known as the TRIP system for, for those in the insurance world. Um, so we transitioned from that to PIVOT. PIVOT isn't an acronym, it's just the name of the system um, there. And so yeah, we transitioned to that. And so that's just our new system of record that holds all of the insurance, um, insurance policy and claims information with a couple others um, there. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the web reports as well as Tableau. Tableau is another system uh, that enables us to show reporting data. Uh, and then we know, like I said, we had some, some issues with some downloads. So we're going to do a little bit of tips and tricks there around how to download things that you might need. Talk about what's coming soon. And again, then hit on those ad hoc data requests. So 
If you hit me, get Sam. Awesome. Um, so what is pivot and what is part? So we're gonna uh, dive into a little bit. So as I was talking about pivot, is the, is the new system of record. Um, sometimes you'll see it abbreviated as SOAR. Um, it provides near-time validation of flood insurance business data rules and business data rules uh, instead of almost waiting 60 days uh, with, with our old system. So in our old system, um, there, was, there was a very long cycle that, that were the, essentially our insurance companies would submit information and then uh, we would check that and make sure that it was okay. So sometimes that system took 30 to 30 to 60 days uh, on a good uh, on a good cycle uh, and so we would be reporting on data that was a little bit old and stale so our new system allows for near real-time um, near real-time validation of data and near real-time inputs of data via what's called APIs automated program infrastructure um, and so it, what is that essentially is being able to exchange data in real time so um so it works more like an app for your, like your bank account you charge something you see that charge happen immediately uh on your app same thing with the uh same thing with the system now so this is, so the wio sells a policy we can see that policy sold in real time um and um they submit that information all within the same day uh normally they have about 24 hour 24 hour reporting cycle so we know about it at the time, at the time of submittal, um, and then we report about, we report on everything that happened the previous day, the next day. So we're in our reporting cycle. We're only one day behind. And then so part is the pivot analytics and reporting tool um, is a modernized reporting system. So um, instead of having where we have Euronet and Data Exchange and some of the other sources out there, we now have um, this tool called Part and which has which has our policy and claims data and some of it overlaid onto maps to do uh, insurance reporting um, uh, in, in terms of policies and claims and do um, disaster reporting. So those are our big ones uh, to be able to report on what's going on in the insurance world and being able to do that over pro programmatic oversight and then being able to do disaster reporting and making sure that we're servicing our policyholders in the, in the proper way. Um, so next slide. So here's a here is a list of all the currently available report, reports um, um, for for uh, the purposes of emergency management. We'll say um, uh, so our emergency managers, our state hazard mitigation officers, our NFIP coordinators, and anyone else who kind of fulfills that FMNI role has access to these uh, 20 or so reports. And we just added new ones. Um, for repetitive loss and repair, severe repetitive loss under both the insurance definition as well as the um, FMA de definition for grants. Um, so we know that those two definitions are a little bit different and serve a little bit different purpose. So we made sure to highlight those four definitions for RLSRL and those just came out last week. And I think that is the, I think those were the ones that people were really waiting on to be modernized and a little and, and, and be read on. Um, so if we roll into the next slide, um, this is how you get in. If you, if, if you don't have a, uh, if you don't have an account already, um, this is, this is how you sign up for an account. You just go to HTTPS, uh, colon forward slash forward slash pivot dot FEMA dot gov, uh, from your, from a non-government computer and you can register there and, uh, create a new and create a, create a username and login. Um, we'll talk a little bit about ISAAs a little bit, but for the majority of folks who, who may already have an account, um, this is what happens when you log in. So, so you, you were right on it, Steve. Thank you, sir. Yes, community, I see a question from Foster, community flood plan administrators can access this data. I will put a high caveat on that. So what we did was that the regions, our, our regional FEMA, FM, FNI folks, um, uh, have, have around 20 slots. So there's 20 slots for folks within their region who, for, to help out with whoever fulfills their FM&I role, who helps them do that. They have 20, 20 roles that they can fulfill. Um, and, and that is how, uh, that is, that is how people can get access into the system. So we'll talk a little bit about how that kind of rolls through there in a minute. Um, 
And I saw the question about ISAAs and indemnification, so we'll kind of get there towards the end of the slide around, private, around some of the privacy stuff. Um, but if you do have an ISAA and you do have access to the pivot system um, and you would like to see PII, uh, FM&I, sorry, uh, so, sorry, Monica, you are right. I'm not doing a good job with my acronyms. Um, so anybody who really does that flood plane management um, mitigation or insurance role. Um, so, so anybody who helps out with that, emergency managers, um, state hazard mitigation officers, who folks who work in those offices, um, folks who work um, with, the, with the NFIP coordinators, anyone in those offices has access or can get uh, access to the part system by um, signing what's called an ISAA. And I wrote down what an ISAA is uh, in, in, the, in the slide that says ISAA is in there. That's essentially an information sharing agreement. Um, th there's another word in there and I can't remember what it is uh, at the moment. Um, my apologies on that one. Um, but, uh, so let's say you've signed, I should probably, maybe I should have started with that one first, but oh well. Um, so you, you make sure you have access to the system. You come in here. The first screen that you're greeted with is, hey, do you want to see any reports that contain PII? And if so, please check the, please check the box for the reason why. And the reason that we did this is because it's an automated fashion. It allows us to comply with Privacy Act stuff and privacy policy stuff. Ah, thank you, Eddie. <laughs> you're the best. Um, it allows us to... Uh, know who's accessed what data, when, for what purpose, uh, per privacy guidance and privacy, um, uh, and per privacy guidance and per privacy privacy law. So we have to keep a record of that. So this helps autom helps us automate that instead of trying to do that through a paper trail, which is great. Um, so you just come in, and if you would like access to a report that contains PII, you click what's called the routine use letter our routine use, and there's a letter that is associated with that routine use, um, and you say why I am I need PII, and then you get the you click that button, you have access to those reports that contain that level of PII. So uh, next slide. So once you're in there, there's two main types of reports. The first type that's really easy to use is called uh, we like to call those our web reports. Um, so they don't they look just like you would on a regular website. You fill in a couple of blanks, and most of the time these are searches that return vast amounts of information, um, be it by company, policy, um, the insurer's name, some of the recipient relate, and then our repetitive loss searches and summaries also look like this. Um, very easy to use, um, and you just fill in the blanks in some of those searches. Um, and um, that, and then and then you hit run report, and then it'll generate the report that you're looking for based on the search criteria you asked for. So uh, we slide to the next one. Um, the way you get there is by, is by clicking on part reports once you are in the system and then next one. Uh, and then you can search for any type of report that you're looking for. Now it's based on keywords. So even if you don't know, if you don't remember that old Bureau Net report, uh, but you do remember some things like policy, I wanna see all the reports are, are um, subject to policies, then you can type that in the uh, upper upper uh, right-hand corner. And now there's a new slide out tool uh, on the left-hand side to make that even easier to get to if you're in a report and don't want to go back to the home screen. So um, next slide. And then um, this is an example of what is, what's called a Tableau report. So these ones are a little bit trickier to use. All the filters are at the top, same thing. You kind of pick and search and select some of the filtered criteria you'd like. And then to download, instead of it being just a really quick or really easy quick download CSV like it is in some of the rep reports, in the Tableau reports, there's a there's there is the tip or the or the trick. Um, uh, you just click into the report. Make sure you click one of those cells, and you'll see it kind of highlight and kind of the rest of it gray out a little bit. And you go to the upper right hand corner and hit download. Um, and then if you click to the next slide. Uh, oh, so sorry, that was about the filters. Um, so that's the filter. You make sure you filter the data accordingly. That's, that's my apologies there, Steve. I think I put them in the, right, the wrong order there. So uh, next slide. There we go. Um, this will show, it'll, it'll bring up a box that shows um, 
what you can download. And there's various different types. So the disabled view and the way that you know that maybe I might not have done exactly what I needed to, things will be grayed out there and you won't be able to download them and see them. Um, so that's how you kind of know, yeah, I need to go back and check and make sure I clicked in a box. Um, and we're going to be redoing that stuff to make it a little bit more user friendly. But for right now, this is kind of, uh, unfortunately, the way it works a little bit. Um, but to, if you look at the enable view on the right, that's the way it should show up. Once you pop in that, once you pop in that screen, click download, you can download any of these different types. And um, we're going to go through just a couple of them just so you can kind of see what they look like. But you essentially click one of those and click download. Uh, all right, Steve. One more for me, yep, click the download button and then you'll be asked kind of what you would like to do. So if you want an image, one of these little screens will pop up that says open, you can open or save um, however you want. So one of one of the different data, data types is download. Um, next one, um, or the other one is .csv. You can click um, download all, all the rows as a CSV. Make sure you click that and then you should be good to go there. And then one more. Um, yeah, and, then, and then this is what happens when you download as a CSV. Um, and then uh, we should be, it, and that's what it kind of looks like. This looks like a regular Excel spreadsheet uh, there. Um, the same way, the same way it would on the screen, just in, a, in an Excel format that's easier to manip manipulate uh, if, if you are an Excel wizard. Uh, so a CSV translate to Excel. All right, and my apologies, I think Bruce is driving. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so that's the same thing. So the other type of, uh, the, the, another easy way to get um, downloads for a, for a CSV is through that cross tab type. And it's the same thing. You would click open with and then okay. And then you would get that same CSV. You'd get that same CSV as a Excel spreadsheet. It's the same thing, it pops up as cross tab. So you can choose rows or you can download the whole thing as a cross tab. And that's kind of the difference between, um, between the two there. All right. And then the other one is a PDF format. So we know that um, sometimes when folks are going out to the field or they just need to hand deliver a report to somebody and I just want it to look clean, easy, um, uh, or, or be able to, pop what, you, what you're seeing there into some kind of slide presentation. You can also download as a, as a, download the report as a PDF um, and it'll actually create the PDF for you and you can choose the view that you would like um, and you can adjust the sizing and make sure that it lays out exactly the way you want it for the presentation or paper uh, format that you're using and then you just hit create PDF. Um, and, then, and then you get a PDF that looks just like the report did. Um, so the next thing that we're going to be working on in the system is, is we've definitely gotten a lot of feedback around the usability and some of the user, user interface um, uh, of, of the system. So that's going to be where we dive into next, making sure that it's a little bit prettier, a little bit nicer, a little bit more modern, um, and, and a little bit just, I, I, I would say intuitive, right? So some of the stuff just isn't intuitive. Um, it's not, it's not like, like logging into Google, uh, and, and, and a lot of it just intuitively making sense. So that's kind of that's kind of where we're going next along with any other feedback we receive. So if there's something that that um, that you guys want to see or isn't working right or you're having trouble um, with the system in any way, then if you could please um, contact shoot an email to FEMA-NFIP pivot support at FEMA.dhs.gov. Um, we we have a whole team who's who has a service desk around being able to provide support to to, um, to to our internal and external partners. So um, please use that site there. It, even if it's just an idea, hey, it would be great if the columns were switched or if it was a different color or uh, you know, all the way up to, I would like to see a map that shows this, that, and the other. Um, knowing those use cases directly from our users and getting that feedback is kind of vital to being able to make the system work um, better. So we are always open to that feedback and that's how that happens. And just uh, FYI, those who joined on late, uh, we will be sending out this or posting this PowerPoint on our uh, committee webpage. So if you don't want to write down that long URL, it will be posted. 
Oh, thanks, Bruce. Um, the other thing is if you have an account already, in the upper right hand side when you sign in under your name, there's actually like a help, uh, there's help guides, there's help videos. Um, so if you have any feedback on those as well, how they are or are not meeting your needs, or there's something that you would like to see a video around or more guidance around, um, we, we, we take feedback on that piece as well. So um, uh, the, it, it is not just for the, for the reporting tool or the data, it can also be around anything that, that, might, that, that, that might cause you um, any sort of churn. All right. So um, ad hoc data requests. So again, if there, is, if there is any data that isn't in the system and you, and you absolutely, you know, we need it to be able to make sure that we can do our jobs and administer the program, then we ask you to just to work with your regional FEMA office. And what they'll do is they'll generate a request ticket for someone on, on, um, on either my staff or some of our, um, our system staff to be able to kind of work through that. Um, so everything, every ad hoc quest, request, we're going to make sure you, there's an, an associated routine use. Yes, we're using the data the right way. There's an associated need to know, and then any additional information that we might need to fill out paperwork as we're starting to hand, hand um, deliver data to folks, or I won't say hand deliver electronically, to de deliver folks, data to folks outside of the system. Um, and so um, the number one thing we're always concerned about is making sure we protect the data, the, the protect information on our policyholders, which are even some of us internally. So we want to make sure we're doing that in the proper way in accordance with the policy that, that we've been given. And I saw a couple of questions. So we're going to dig into privacy next, I promise. Um, so I'll make sure, I, uh, I hope I get those questions at the end. So um, if I do miss them after this privacy session, uh, please retype them um, or I'll try to go back and say, please answer my question from Scott. Um, so I see something about the indemnification clause. I think I answered that one, that one, that one. Um, oh, do you have to register for a pivot, uh, for an account in pivot if we're getting an ISAA or will access be granted as a part of the ISAA process? So right now it is not granted as a part of the ISAA process. The ISAA, um, process is, so, is, is, is different from the system access piece, but you do need a signed ISAA to be able to upload into the um, system as you register. So once that ISA is complete, please take a hold of that. Um, and as you're registering, there's actually a place for you that says upload ISAA and, uh, and uh, that, that is how that works. Um, can we just get summary data such as policies and force and occupancy without an ISA? Absolutely you can. Um, if, if you don't have an ISAA um, and you don't, want to be uh, like a privileged user, we can absolutely join as a non-privileged user and get all kinds of summary statistics um, with no PII associated with it. So good question, Bill. Um, so I think, yes. Uh, so everything that is, the for Tim, you can obtain summary data by zip code, um, census, Census track and block is not in any of the reports, but um, I think it's by, you can do state, state, uh, zip code, um, county, NFIP community, all of those without an ISA are, are searchable geolocation type, type things. Um, not con congressional district isn't in there yet. That would be a special request for congressional district. We're working to get some of that in the system. It's not, it's just not inherently there. So we have to kind of hand jam some of that stuff in. Um, and the same thing around census track and census block. Um, it just didn't come with the software that, that we have right now. So we're working to try to integrate some of those data points into our reporting. Um, but if you need them and you'd like the, to see them in there in a particular report, please again, shoot an email to the, to the email pivot support site. And that way we can keep a record of it and say, hey, Tim, we're working on your request to make sure that congressional district is in our reports. Um, uh, indemnity. Okay, got it. Um, so, yes, so there, there are questions for the, for there are, there are things around indemnity clauses, and I'll make sure I touch on that in the routine use first IA, ISAA section. So, um, I know a lot of people aren't well versed in the Privacy Act, and I promise I wasn't either until I came here and had to be a government steward of data. It works a little bit differently here. So, um, the, the rules that we are under that kind of govern us start with the legal requirements of the Privacy Act of 1974. 
So uh, Bruce, you can click into that. Um, and it basically establishes a code that governs the collection, maintenance, use, and dissemination of individuals that are maintained in system of record by federal agencies. So it basically tells us, it draws the box around the rules that we have to have when we are sharing data as a federal agency, uh, realizing that we are under stricter guidelines and, and must adhere to good policy practices as part of the federal government. Um, so um, that's that one. Um, that's a, that is that is the Privacy Act uh, in a nutshell. Um, so the National Flood Insurance Program, since we talked about Pivot a little bit as a system of record or SOR, uh, coming under that we have what's called um, we have records. So we have, as a part of every entry into that system is called a record. And the important thing about these records is that we have to maintain them in a way that that is uh, that that meets that Privacy Act. That's why that's important. And when we disclose that information um, or portions of that information, um, it has to be it has to be according to just to simplify it, a need to know as well as um, as well as a um, uh, a valid need to know, and it has to be timely, and it has to um, conform to this what's called system of record notice. So it has to be one of the routine uses defined under that. Um, next slide. Uh, one second, please. Having a little technical difficulty. Here we go. So, um, so a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of you may be well versed in routine use letters versus ISAAs. So a lot of what we were directed to do in the past is um, is conduct uh, is make sure that for every data share, every time we share data with a particular party, we needed to have an ISAA in place. Um, and that uh, and we shied away from really the routine use letter um, um, circumstance because because. Um, because it didn't quite meet the needs, it didn't quite fit under the current policy at the time or the current translation of the policy at the time. Um, so a little bit of that now is changing. Um, so if we slip into the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about ISAAs. Um, so um, we set up the system essentially to do some of the ISAA work for us. Um, so if you were accessing, if you were accessing um, I, uh, PII in a, in, a, in a continual manner, and we know you needed it for program, and for program um, administrative needs. Um, it was set up on um, least privilege, role-based access um, that, we, that we needed uh, in, in order to, to fulfill the Privacy Act. And then the other part of the Privacy Act is making sure that we're able to record and know who's accessed what PII when, because a policyholder could actually call us um, and, and ask who's asked who is asked for my data and we have to be able to tell them. Um, so that's why the system is set up the way it is and that's why we traditionally defaulted to ISAAs. Um, so next section. Um, so over the past few years we've really worked to develop and shape the, the um, to, to really develop and shape that policy in a way that's better. Um, so we've had a couple hiccups along the way uh, and a couple setbacks there as, as people who might be in the, who might know uh, about the privacy stand down and such. Um, but the, the, the main tenets that still remain and that are still in place is that we still need some form of data sharing agreement before we can distribute PII to external, uh, to external parties. So it could be an ISA, it could be a routine newsletter, or it could be kind of how you interact with the system and having that ISA in place um, so, so that, uh, so that, that, that system level is covered. Um, so we currently have um, NFIP coordinators, state hazard mitigation officers, emergency managers, or anybody who's fulfilling that flood plane management, emergency manager, an insurance role can have access to PII within the, within the system through an ISA. So the next slide. Um, so that, uh, so that covers the, the pivot ISA and then on the top. So if any, if you require data, that is, that is uh, on a routine basis. Um, so more than once, once a year, um, more than once a year, 
And that would be for PII that's like name, address, uh, particular parts of the policy, then yes, um, that would be a, a regular ISAA. Um, and you would have to fill in, um, you'd have to fill in um, one of the routine uses as to why you needed that data. Now, the, here's, the, here's the kicker. So if we go one more slide, Bruce. Thank you, sir. We have, we have now we're reinstituting using a routine use letter. Um, so the routine use letter is when an organization has a one-time need for FEMA data um, per year. So, so for example, our CRS recertifications or hazard mitigation grants, if you need repetitive loss data or, or severe repetitive loss data to kind of fulfill that stuff and make sure that those, the, that those programs get administered, um, it's administered smoothly. Um, we use the routine use letter and that routine use letter does have one without an indemnification clause if the parties that you're working with um, don't appreciate that indemnification language or saying that they can't meet the indemnification language then we, then we have an alternate routine use letter without the indemnification clause. Um, so the good news about the routine use letter is um, they're, they're uh, much less of an, an administrative burden on everybody. So FEMA, our partners, and then the parties who are asking for data, um, it, is, it is, is much simpler and easier uh, to fill out um, minimal signatures needed. It doesn't have to go all the way to the privacy office anymore. Um, so it can all be handled um, pretty, pretty streamlined. Um, so this is what we're doing. Um, so I know that a lot of, there's been a lot of concern around the time it takes to turn around an ISA. Um, it, it went from days, days and maybe a week at the longest to months and months of time. And we know that we had, we had um, around 110 or so ISAs that were just stuck and we couldn't get that out the door because they had to be reviewed by FEMA privacy and, um, and, and by Department of Homeland Security privacy. Um, so, um, Instead of, doing, instead of doing that, what we did is we took a deep dive into those ISAAs at the time of the privacy stand down and, and realized that actually most of them can be done with a routine newsletter. So what we're doing at headquarters is we're proactively reaching back out to those parties, letting them know that instead of an ISAA, here's a routine newsletter, acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge the routine newsletter um, that you've read it um, and that uh, and that you agree with the with the data that you need and it is for this purpose and we can turn that data around very very quickly instead of waiting for the ISA to be signed by all the different parties who have to do that so um, that is a recent change and it's already in the process of going out so some of your stakeholders may be seeing these routine newsletters coming to them in the very uh, it could already be happening but it, it, we're working through that backlog first and it should be done here relatively shortly, um, making sure that those parties get those routine use letters and we can get that data out the door. Um, so that's, that's one of the big things that's happening. One of the big updates I wanted to make sure that we had time to share with you guys um, that we're doing to kind of reduce that burden. The term PII is defined in the Privacy Act, yes. Um, and it might be defined in my slides. Um, so if we click, is it, do I have one more? No, ah, I'm, Next time, I'll make sure to add that to the slide. So, so let, me, let me interrupt, because uh, uh, Chad is on deck, and I want to give him time to uh, give us an update on reform and uh, reauthorization, though I know he has a whole uh, for all members. Uh, can you go in and answer some of the questions that are there on the chat while Chad is uh, presenting, Nikki? I will mute. Yes, absolutely. Thank okay. you for and, no, and Nikki, thank you so much. This is great. If you can just put like the at sign, so if time had a question, you put at time, so time, people know who you're, which question you're answering, because this is pretty deep. Some of this stuff, especially if you're new at it. So, uh, thank you so much. Chad, are you on deck? Our ASFPM uh, Grand Poobah? Uh Yes, I am. I, I certainly am. How you doing? All right. Good. And can you give us an update in about 10 minutes? I certainly can try. Um, so at least here in Madison, Wisconsin, it's, it's the afternoon. So good afternoon to some folks. I think maybe on the West Coast, we're still not quite there yet. Um, but I am Chad Berginis, Executive Director of ASFPM. And um, 
and the insurance committee just wanted me to give an update on NFIP reauthorization and reform. Next slide, please. So the probably the, the big thing that we should uh, be paying attention to is that uh, here in about a week or so, the NFIP is set to expire. Um, yesterday, uh, the House did pass a continuing resolution. Now, the CR is kind of interesting because um, uh, they, they took a little bit different track than they had in previous um, uh, CRs. Uh, typically, the authorization runs out when the funding runs out, but the, um, uh, but the CR that passed funds the government through December 11th, while it authorizes the NFIP all the way through September 30th of 2021. Um, so, you know, it's, it's been a while. Uh, and so this is maybe a bit more of a reminder. Um, but there are some, um, there, there are some pending NFIP reform bills out there. Uh, back, I believe it was in 2019, actually, the House passed a couple bills, 3167 and 3111, out of committee. Um, and both were com comprehensive bills, um, and, uh, and those earned ASFPM support, uh, even though there are a couple things that maybe, you know, we, we could, um, you know, try to improve on. Um, the uh, Senate Bill S-2187 was introduced in July 2019, uh, not 2020, uh, uh, and, um, and it also was a comprehensive bill, but it had a few more errors or problems from our perspective, and so it, we support elements of that bill, um, but we, we don't support the whole bill. But I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on those because the reality um, that has happened, uh, and and I think it it was cemented um, with um, the uh, probably an impending Supreme Court battle, consuming all of the time of Congress um, for the term as well as some of the lame duck. Uh, but it, we are basically uh, of the opinion that there will be no bill passing this Congress. And um, beginning in January of 2021, we start over with a new two-year Congress. Uh, and so essentially what happens is that the bills that were passed either in 2019 or 2020 disappear and new bills have to be reintroduced and, um, and approved uh, by, by the new Congress. Next slide. So, uh, you know, a couple things that, um, uh, that, that we saw as kind of similarities and, and differences in, in the bill, bills, um, and some of these jibe really nicely with ASFPM priorities as well. Um, one of the ASFPM priorities um, for NFIP reform is to, is to uh, have a more positive change and increase cost of compliance. And so both the House and Senate bills um, tended to agree with that, um, uh, with the potential increase to $60,000 um, uh, up from $30,000 now. Um, also, there um, was some concept in each of the bills for a state revolving loan fund for mitigation. Uh, and there's a lot of opinions out there in terms of loan funds, um, but we're of the opinion um, that it's really another tool in the toolbox. It's certainly not for everybody, but it could be something that's useful. Um, also, we were very pleased to see that both bills had some provision for assistance to lower income property owners. Now, um, uh, you know, this is one of those things that I think you're going to see ASFPM becoming much more intentional with over the next few years is to really focus on social justice and equity kinds of issues as it relates to the programs and policies dealing with flooding. Um, and so, um, so this is something that, you know, as the program itself attempts to become more actuarially sound, um, there is an increasing need to recognize and help out lower income. Uh, folks. Also, um, both of them had uh, caps on uh, increases in flood insurance premiums, and both had some kind of modest attempt to uh, begin to address the whole urban flooding issue. Um, I, and, and, and it wasn't necessarily through any kind of mandates or requirements as it, as it was through technical assistance and some kind of grant type uh, function there. Next slide, please. 
So, um, but there are there also were some um, uh, were some differences, and you know another ASFPM priority in NFIP reform is that we have got to address the debt in the program. Now, I think um, at least you know with the um, with, with the current administration, um, the monetary policies, interestingly enough, I think will have an indirect benefit on the NFIP um, with the. Um, with the prevailing view that interest rates should stay low. And as long as interest rates stay low, um, you know, the debt in the NFIP um, is a debt uh, that does accrue interest. And, and so that is helpful. Uh, but if we get anywhere close to uh, normal interest rates, um, then the debt in the NFIP becomes very problematic uh, that way. Um, also, there's a difference um, in terms of the authorization for flood map. Uh, funding. The House bill would increase that authorization by $100 million a year. Um, and even though those sound like huge numbers, um, the, uh, you know, ASFPM has produced an initial and now an updated flood mapping for the nation report that really is a cost model for, um, uh, for flood mapping. And, uh, you know, basically estimating in the neighborhood of four to $10 billion to, to finish mapping the country um, just for those items that are required. Uh, and so again, uh, it's something that we're certainly supportive of um, with that increased amount. The, um, the also, and, and this is something we have been working on um, and it will be a very high priority uh, for us is that um, the House bill has what's, what's um, we term the authorized CAP SASE program. Uh, and it also, basically, I believe, doubles the amount uh, of funding from current levels. Now, the Senate bill didn't have it. However, we've been working with Senate committee to um, make sure that that provision would be in there, um, you know, should the Senate bill have that. So, um, so in terms of, you know, other ASFPM priorities um, uh, that, you know, that we have for NFIP reform, you know, whether it be for these bills or for the new Congress, um, you know, I mentioned the, the flood map funding um, uh, 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 authorization, um, the uh, addressing affordability, enhancing increased cost of compliance. Uh, we'd also like to see a bit more focus on pre-disaster mitigation of at-risk structures, especially focusing on doing more for repetitive loss buildings um, in, that way. Um, and then kind of the new things that will probably work themselves into our official uh, priorities for NFIP reform would be this authorized CAP SASE program, as well as, um, uh, and, and it was really the topic that Nikki was talking a lot about um, just in the, in the previous presentation, some kind of relief um, in the NFIP to the Privacy Act for certain kinds of data and information. Um, you know, we'll be, um, uh, you know, ASFPM has been very active on this particular issue as a result of our members, um, uh, impacts on our members. And, um, and so we are um, really kind of working on two tracks. We're working um, with FEMA uh, to, uh, to try to improve internal processes and things to make it workable. Um, but we're also in communication with Congress. Uh, and you know, the, the funding bill from the House uh, that was passed this past July included as part of the report language, a requirement for FEMA to report back to Congress uh, in terms of kind of those pro that progress and um, and depending on uh, you know the the ease of access and 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 issues being ironed out and again um, uh, we we understand um, that there are things that uh, that FEMA can do there are things that have to be approved at DHS and then there's things that may not be able to be done um, we have some members calling for um, uh, potentially some legislative relief uh, in this way um, that then uh, can help us get back to sharing the data um, uh, for appropriate uses um, that way. So, um, so that's something that we'll be monitoring closely and that could be part of our overall um, reform effort going forward. Next slide. Okay, so um, this, is, uh, this is my last slide and uh, I think Bruce, I'm doing 
fairly okay on time here. Um, but I just wanted to mention this uh, because we're very excited. Uh, for those of you that may have poked around on our website this summer, um, we have uh, done a significant upgrade to our website. We're still um, working on some different pieces of that. Um, but one of the things that we have uh, activated uh, actually this past week. It, it's been there, but we've really um, kind of officially launched it this past past week is the ASFPM Engage webpage. Um, and basically, you can find that, you know, at our website, floods.org, under um, policy and advocacy tab. And then there's a page called ASFPM Engage. Um, and, and this does a couple things. First of all, it um, is where we're going to be um, tracking all the different pieces of federal legislation that, that are on our radar at this point. Um, also, it lets us curate a certain subsection, subselection of those. And so you can actually scroll down and see the actual NFIP bills in terms of the status of those in the, uh, you know, in the current Congress. And then finally, uh, and this is a feature that we, that we literally launched just this week, is that it allows you to very quickly, like in less than five minutes, um, be able to engage your congressional delegation on an issue um, uh, on an issue that we would help write up as an engagement issue. Uh, and so the first engagement issue that we put out there dealt with flood map funding. Um, and already ASFPM members um, have, um, have been able to um, write their members of Congress using this tool. Um, and basically we have outreached, I believe, to um, over 30 uh, US senators that way. Uh, so far. So, uh, and that's just in a couple days. So basically, it just asks you for your, um, your name and address information. Um, we, it pre-populates a, um, a message there. You can customize it to add in your own story. And then you literally click send and it will send it to your appropriate um, members of Congress. So we're very excited um, to be able to have that tool available. And also, again, uh, it's one of those things we do realize that not all of you uh, can, um, uh, can engage Congress um, either in your, uh, at least in your official capacity, in, in your job capacity, um, but you, many of you probably can do that personally. Uh, and this is a tool to help you to do that. Uh, so with that, Bruce, I will end and be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Steve, you want to finish up here? I take myself off mute, Bruce. Oh. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions for Chad in the chat box today, but I noticed that Nikki's been busy answering a lot of questions. <laughs> and I want to remind everybody we will have all of these slides posted on our Flood Insurance Committee website at the ASFPM main website on floods.org. I want to thank Chad for his comments. Uh, I was kind of late breaking news about that NFIP reauthorization just yesterday. You, you almost eliminated half your slides right there. <laughs> and, uh, yep. yep. And, in, and for those of you who don't know it, uh, that's me in the boat wearing, wearing my special t-shirt that I bought. I was going to wear it to Fort Worth and then they canceled the conference and we went virtual. So I think that's about all we got today, Bruce. And we're right on time. Yep. Uh, again, and we did record this. We're going to see if we can get this up uh, on the side as well. Um, and for those who haven't been able to maybe answer all the questions, we'll look, if we can capture chat, we're all new at this. Uh, we'll see if uh, some of the speakers can answer some of the unanswered questions as well. Uh, so we appreciate you um, hanging in there with us and as we all learn this new stuff. Uh, we'll keep it open for one or two more minutes for folks, to, Nikki, to jump in and answer a few questions. I'm going to have to jump off at the top of the hour for another Zoom meeting. Um, but thank you, Steve, uh, as well, yeah, and sure. all of our speakers. Right. I, I think I'm just, I got to go to Bruce. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, it's the top of the hour. Uh, 
Thank you, everybody. Um, Nikki, if there's a couple more of those questions you need to get to, I'll get with you as well. Uh, and I know, Tony, you had a bunch out there. So I uh, hate to cut this off, um, but we want to respect everybody's time. Um, so thanks a lot. And with that, uh, say goodbye to Steve's back and his I Love Flood Insurance t-shirt, which he can tell you where he bought that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.